So this text is, what, what, what is this text? Well, who do we get from this text? What's the name of this text? How do you all know this text? Doubting, Doubting Thomas. Yes, and, and, and I told you last year, and I'll tell you again this year, Thomas gets a bad rap. It's not a, it's not a good way to look at this text. There's a lot of stuff happening here this morning that we've got to understand, right? It said on the first day of the week, the disciples were in an upper room and they were in there and, and they were shut the door and they had locked it. The first day of the week. What day is this? It's Sunday. More importantly, what Sunday is it? Say it loud. Who said it? Say it louder. It's Easter. This is Easter night is when this happens. It's not a week later. It's not any time later. This is the evening of the day that Jesus walked out of the tomb. And the disciples are locked in this room for fear of their life, right? Because they just saw two days earlier the man that they'd been following for three years killed on a cross. So they're all rightly afraid. Except, who's not there? Thomas. And where is he? He's fishing? Is that what I heard? <laughs> I don't know if Thomas was a fisherman or not, so I don't, I don't know about that. But I mean, we could conjecture all day as to where in the world Thomas is at. The only thing that we do know is that he's not locked in the room with the other disciples. Maybe he's out trying to figure out how he's going to move on with his life now, right? We just did this thing for three years, and now things have fallen apart, so I've got to figure out what I'm going to do now, right? We've been there before. You've done a job for so many years and then things happen, the company downsizes, and that means what? Oh, you don't have a job anymore. So now you've got to figure out how to move on with life, right? It's, it's just the way of things. It's the way things happen. So Thomas is maybe out trying to figure out how he's going to make his way in the life now. Maybe he's out telling people what the women came back and told them, right? Because in John we get the Mary Magdalene and Mary... We're at the tomb, Mary Magdalene and Peter and John. Not Mary, the mother. That's other Gospels. In John, it's Mary Magdalene and John and Peter. Maybe Thomas listened to what Mary Magdalene had to say, that Jesus had rose and that he was going to go ahead of them to Galilee and he was going to meet them. Maybe he believed it. Maybe he was out telling people about it. We don't know what Thomas was doing. But I want to say this morning that Thomas, more than being a doubter, is a realist. Right? How many of you want to see something before you're going to believe it? It's okay to admit that. You really, I, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. It's like Thomas meets the disciples and the disciples say, Thomas, Thomas, you won't believe it. We, we saw Jesus. He came and he stood before us and he showed us his hand and he showed us his side. It was so cool. And Thomas is like, quit pulling my leg. I don't believe it. It's not that he doubted what they were saying. It's just... He was a pragmatist. He, wanted to see, he, he was pragmatic. He wanted to see Jesus. He wasn't going to believe him, right? Because we all know that seeing is believing, right? How many of you remember a long, long time ago, David Copperfield made the Statue of Liberty disappear? Right? You all saw it. The Statue of Liberty actually disappear? No. no. Just because you see something doesn't mean that it's necessarily believable. Right? We can see things all the time now on the internet or pictures of things, right? People have ways of doctoring things. Seeing is not necessarily believing. But Thomas wanted to see Jesus. So then the next week they're all again in this upper room and the door's locked again, which I still don't get why they have to be in a room with the door locked. I mean, Mary told them that Jesus was alive. And just the week before, Ten of them saw Jesus stand amongst them in that room, but yet still, still they are a week later with the door locked. And Jesus says to them, he appears to them, and he says, peace be with you again. And he says to Thomas, look, here are my hands. Put your, put your fingers in the holes in my hand, and here's my side. Put your hand in. 
Do not doubt, but believe. That's not actually what Jesus said, right? He said, do not be unbelieving, but believe. Because doubt is not a bad thing. It's okay to question. It's okay to look for the reality in things. But Jesus says to him, do not be unbelieving, but believe. And what does Thomas do? Does he walk up to Jesus and take his hand and put it in his hands? Does he stick his hand in his side? No. In a moment that he sees Jesus, he realizes that the reality that he is living within is way too small to contain a God that is way too big to do what Thomas thinks that he's going to do. And Thomas's reality is blown completely apart and he falls to his knees and he says, My Lord and my God. He's the only one of the disciples who ever confesses that Jesus is Lord. Here in John, at the end. Right? None of the ten the week before said anything about it. Thomas, the one who we say doubted the fact that Christ rose from the dead, is the one and only who confesses that Christ is Lord and God. It's not that he is a doubter. Thomas is the confessor. Thomas is the one that shows us what it is to live in a reality that is beyond the concept that we can possibly imagine. We can't fit God in our box because God is way too big to fit inside of our box. Thomas is the one disciple who shows us the way to allow God to come into our lives and show us the reality that only God can give us. Because all of them were smacked upside the head with that reality, right? Just two days before, as I said, this is Sunday of Easter. Just two days before, they watched their master, their teacher, crucified on a cross. And here they are cowering in a room, afraid for their own lives. Because reality sometimes isn't what we think it is. Because we want it to be the way that we see it. We want it to be the way that we know it. We want it to be the way that we can understand it. But God says, don't be unbelieving, but believe. Believe that I can do great things that are greater than you could ever imagine. Believe that when I tell you something that it's going to be held true and that I'm going to follow through on it. Believe that I love you beyond all, comprehen- all, beyond all comprehension and believe in my reality, not yours. Believe that I am the one who controls everything and that it will work the way that I say it's going to. Thomas doesn't come to an understanding of faithfulness and and not questioning that morning or that evening. Thomas comes to the understanding that his reality is way too small to contain a God that is way too big. Thomas understands that we can't have a vision that is defined by failure. We have to have a vision that's defined by God's possibility. That we can't have a vision that's governed by sacred scarcity but we have to have a vision that's governed by God's abundance. That we can't have a vision that's ruled by remembered offenses. We can't have a vision that's ruled by what we've done. We have to have a vision that's ruled by what we've been set free from and have been empowered to do. You see, our reality, when we stop and think about it, is way too small because it doesn't allow God to be as big as he can be. So live into that reality. Live into the reality that, yes, we've messed it up, and we think about God and keep Him, try to keep him in our boxes. But allow him to come and stand before you and to show you the reality that he has for you so that you can then fall on your knees and confess, my Lord and my God, give me the life that you've set before me and help me to show others that life that they can have too. So live in his reality, not yours. Live in his abundance, not our scarcity. Live in his forgiveness, not our sinfulness. Live in his joy. Live in his love. Live in his reality.